Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start on my review of This Much Is True by Miriam Margulies. 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 I have no idea how to pronounce her surname. I always thought it was Margoyles. I guess I'm... I had a dyslexic moment or something where I got the Y and the L mixed mixed around. Anyway, this is her memoir. Uh, it doesn't have a very long um, uh, blurb, but I'm going to read you the blurb. Then I'm going to go through and check out my tabs and I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. I'm reading this at the exercise bike on the gym. I started it today, so as you can see, I haven't finished it. Um, but yes, Dane reads... From Blackadder to Call the Midwife, from PG Tips to Harry Potter, BAFTA winning actress Miriam Margulies OBE is our favourite and naughtiest national treasure. This much is true, it's her extraordinary life story. Let's dive on in. So she's talking about her father, um, her, she's Jewish and both of her parents were Jewish, obviously, I guess that's how it works, but her father was a very observant Jew, um, and we get this. Um, it was a kosher home life. Shabbos began at sundown on a Friday evening and ended only on the appearance of three stars in the sky on the following night. During this time, no work, including no cooking nor reading of any text other than the Jewish scriptures, was permitted. Nor later, when the family finally had electricity, could anyone so much as switch on a light. Daddy told me that as a young man in Glasgow, one Friday night he arrived home and discovered that he'd left his front door key behind. He couldn't press the electric doorbell, which would have infringed the Sabbath rule of not creating a spark, and so he'd stood outside in the cold for half the night and nearly caught his death with a very bad chill as a result. I hope he knocked on the door, but these were big houses and no one could have heard him, so he just stood there, shivering in the sub-zero Glasgow night. Of course, to me, that is extraordinary, but that's what he and his family were like. And she says, um, she no longer believes in the Jewish faith, although so powerful are the traditions I was taught that I still fast on Yom Kippur, our Day of Atonement, observe the rules of Passover and keep the dietary laws. I've never eaten bacon, although I'm told I would love it. Yeah, but that's what everyone says. But bacon, though, Jews and vegans have that much in common, I suppose. She says, uh, my family story illustrates the archetypal trajectory of a working class Jewish immigrant family. First, a peddler, then in trade, then in the professions, and then with me, the third generation immigrant in the art. She discovers that her uh, grandfather, um, well, the, he had a reputation for having an eye for the ladies. She says, my cousin Ethel told me he was a devil with the sales girls in his wife's shop and screwed everything that moved. And um, later he found out that um, he, he did indeed have a, a, a fling. Um, I think this is quite interesting just in terms of how DNA testing has changed things. So I'll read this passage out. Last year I discovered beyond all reasonable doubt that Sigian enjoyed an extramarital fling in 1918. This is how I found out. A man in Swindon, Derek Austin, wrote to me suggesting that we were possibly first cousins. We had both shared our DNA on a genealogical website and a match had shown up. At first I was bewildered by this discovery of an unknown relative. I phoned and asked him if he was Jewish. He and his brother had talked, and as far as they both knew, there was no Jewish blood in their family. We worked out that his grandmother had lived around the corner from my grandfather in South East London. He had an affair with this woman, she had a child, and the child had grown up and got married and had two sons. So Derek and I are indeed half first cousins. I invited him, his wife, Ingrid and daughter to visit me in London. We had a wonderful day together, bonding and sharing. I'm sad to say Derek died shortly afterwards, but I'm still in contact with his family and intend to remain so. Of course, my dear grandfather could never imagine that his peccadillo would be discovered over a hundred years later, long after his death in London in 1945 at the age of 78. Genealogy makes those kinds of family secrets much harder to hide. And her mum was quite open with her. Her mum was admitted to 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 um to miriam when she was young that she hadn't loved uh miriam's father when they got married um she kind of married him for the status and respectability because he was middle class he was a doctor which was you know what a lot of um jewish immigrants especially aspired to be um but she grew to love him which i think is sweet and very old school you know so we learn a little bit about about um her birth and you know how her parents came to have her uh, which I think is quite interesting. It's interesting the way that her mother, <laughs> you know, has this superstition, but also this little um, bit about Hitler is interesting as well. Daddy was 42 when I was born in 1941. Ruth, my mother, was 37. They were relatively old to be having a first child, but it was deliberate. Most newly married couples tried to have children, but for 10 years my parents tried not to. It was my mother's wish. Two of her cousins in South Africa had died in childbirth and she was terribly afraid it was a family curse and that the same fate would befall her. So, for 11 years after their marriage, no child was born. But eventually, at the beginning of the Blitz, to mummy's despair, she conceived. I was told it was the terror of an air raid pounding above the cellar where they were sheltering that allowed daddy in and me to be born. Mummy always said that was why I had curly hair. She wanted desperately to have an abortion but it was against the law and no one would do it. So she held on to me and never, for the rest of her life, let me go. 
It was in early 1941, when Mummy was four months pregnant with me, that my parents were bombed out. The house in Plaistow had a direct hit. They lost everything. They fled to Oxford because people said that Oxford would never be bombed, and it never was. Apparently, Hitler had planned that it would be his capital when he won the war because it was such a beautiful city. The other, more pragmatic reason why we ended up in Oxford was that their car, a Morris Oxford, was already in a garage there for repair. So they left London on a train and came to Oxford with nothing but the clothes on their back. She talks about her, her earliest memory and this sounds like the kind of thing that I would have thought as a kid. My earliest memory is of sitting in my pram, sucking my thumb in the front garden of our flat on Banbury Road. A woman came up and said, if you do that, a bogeyman will cut it off. I was only two, but I thought, that woman's mad, how stupid of her. Of course there isn't a bogeyman, no one's coming. I was immediately skeptical and convinced I was right. Nothing has changed. And her mum had a, an interesting habit. She says, Mummy was extremely house proud and she did all the housework in the nude. It was a tad discomforting for our maids and au pair girls, but she liked to get it done then have a bath. She talks about her auntie Muriel. Her mother's called her the scum of the liffy. Uh, mummy saying, t she says, I remember mummy saying to her once, when you go past the dustbin, you don't lift the lid. I don't know, I don't know what that means, but it is obviously an insult. And she says, uh, she, she, was, she was in her bedroom and I remember vividly that Muriel came in, her auntie Muriel, and shut the door behind her. Then she stood in front of it, her back against the door the way they do in Hollywood movies. She said to me in her Irish accent, smiling slightly, your mammy doesn't love you. What a shocking thing to say to a child, I knew that even then. I replied, of course she does, what do you mean? She said, no, your mammy doesn't love you because if your mammy loved you, she'd buy you nice clothes and she'd do your hair nicely and then you'd look nice, but you don't look nice, so your mammy doesn't love you. Such a statement could have been incredibly destructive for a child, but I had complete confidence in my mother's utter devotion to me. I replied, oh, don't be ridiculous. Of course she loves me. You're quite wrong about that. She talks about one of her teachers, Miss Chase, who she loved. She says, I don't know why I loved her so much. I can't remember anything about her or any reason why I should have felt so desperately, passionately involved, other than that she had golden hair, a white face and red cheeks like an apple. It was Miss Chase who was responsible for my first orgasm when I was eight. I was walking past her house in Banbury Road with my mother and as I approached it, I felt this overpowering heat in my loins that was deeply pleasant and rather exhausting. She wasn't even in sight, there was no friction, it was simply the power of longing and despair. Okay then. I was much older than eight when I had my first orgasm and it was not to do with a teacher. And she got into a lot of trouble at school. She says, no other pupil would match me in my outrageousness until Tatty Catcock came to Oxford High School. I was always in detention. I always got caught. I remember when I was given a detention for a Thursday afternoon for some transgression or other. I was obliged to say truthfully, oh, I'm sorry, I can't do that, as I'm already booked for a detention on Thursday, but I could fit Friday in. We get a reference to her mum going to High Wycombe, furniture capital of England, which is where I live. She said uh, her mum often quoted her grandmother's warning, spoken in a German accent, never trust anyone until hair grows in the palm of their hand. As we all know, hair never grows in the palm of your hand. When she had her first period, I think she said she was 11, um, and she, her mum used to kind of use like homemade sanitary towels basically, she didn't get a tampon until later. But this is a story I've heard happen like to other people and more recently as well. That um, you know, it's a problem, people don't teach kids um, how, to, how to use tampons I guess. Anyway, I'll read this whole, this whole paragraph because I think it's interesting. Mummy used to call it being poorly, so of course it always had a negative connotation. It was worrying because when you were playing hockey, you didn't want blood to come through your clothes and be seen. That was always the major anxiety when you had a period. We used to worry about it a lot and think, can people smell it? Does it show? It was the thing you wanted to hide more than anything. You didn't want anyone to see you changing a sanitary towel or dealing with its disposal. Eventually I discovered I didn't have to make my own anymore. Ready-made sanitary towels were available at the chemist. Much later on, after I left Cambridge, Tampax arrived in my life. A friend shouted instructions through the Lou door in a Soho restaurant. Even with her help, I suffered greatly as I inserted and left the cardboard sheath inside me too. She hadn't explained it was merely the cover and the real deal was inside. And that happens a lot. I've seen people on TikTok talking about that happen to them as well. Okay, and then she talks about, I guess her sexual awakening, but also she just talks about being molested, basically. Um, so she's talking about her breasts. I remember an American soldier clapping his hands over them in the street when I was about 12. He didn't hurt or frighten me. I think he might have been drunk because his pals pulled him away from me before anything got nasty. I was quite flattered by the attention. Two of my father's patients molested me. One had a motorbike and took me for a spin into the country. He stopped the bike, took me into a field and asked me to stroke his inflamed member. I did so willingly, stirred by the experience, but not shaken. After I told my parents, I was never alone with him again. All right, so she talks here about her early exposures to sex. Uh, she got a reputation for doing a, uh, giving a good blowjob, apparently. 
Um, so yeah, she met someone called... Uh, well, I'm just going to read this, these three paragraphs out. I then fell in with a group of other older men. I met them when I modelled at the Ruskin School of Art. I used to go along and stand or sit there, fully clothed, facing the class. Standing or sitting still for a long time could, of course, sometimes get a bit boring. But I met and had coffee with the artist, and I quite enjoyed that. One was a retired army officer in his 70s, of impeccable bearing. My parents thought he was delightful, called Major Harding. He was aptly named as he was an experienced groper, but not scary. His advances were gentle and almost affectionate. He talked about my eyes a great deal and then moved on to my breasts. He asked if he could stroke them. I was 17, well brought up, but what woman doesn't like having her breast stroked? I responded merrily to Major Harding, and when it became clear to him that I wouldn't fuck but I would suck, we were on a roll. We met often to go to the cinema or for Sunday tea parties. His pleasure gave me pleasure and proved the template for my sexual activities until I was initiated into the joys of lesbianism. I did a great deal of sucking off because I seemed to be good at it, and it was all I could do. I remember a lusty Hungarian student who once achieved orgasm seven times in a session. So good for him, so tiring for me. I wasn't going to fuck, you see. I knew I wasn't going to do that because I promised my parents I wouldn't. They were highly conventional and deeply moralistic. They couldn't imagine a relationship outside marriage, and it impressed on me that I mustn't have sex. Pregnancy would result, and their hopes and dreams for my future happiness would be destroyed. The subject of sex was difficult for my parents, especially where I was concerned, and indeed possibly where they were concerned too. In those days, a respectable female could not give vent to sexual longings. Intercourse resulted in unwanted children, and masturbation was dirty. That's how it was in the 50s and 60s. Jewish girls were known for sucking off. The man is satisfied and we don't get pregnant. Oral skill enhances your popularity and, if I'm honest, I think I enjoyed the power it lent to me. And she says here, I'm a repository of many confidences. People often tell me private things about themselves or about things that have happened to them that they haven't told anyone else because they trust me. And this was one of those times. Many women come to lesbianism later in life after marriage and children. I've been the confidant of a surprising number of straight women who fall in love with a person, not a sex. And now it's easier for them to follow their emotions and find happiness. It delights me. Um... She talks, she's talking here about somebody she knew who was transgender. Um, she says, uh, It is the vulnerabilities in people rather more than their strengths which allow us to love them. Which I think is a beautiful thought. She goes to see, um, she goes to pose naked for a, an artist called Augustus John. She says, uh, Of course, my parents were very interested to know if Mr. John had behaved himself. And he had. I had nothing untoward to report on that front because he'd comported himself quite impeccably. I'm not sure that I shouldn't be insulted that he didn't attempt at least a quick grope, or whether it was D Dorelia's watchful eye that ruled out any unseemly advances, because I later discovered that Augustus John's insatiable sexual appetite had allegedly resulted in his fathering up to 100 offspring. Supposedly, whenever he walked down the King's Road in Chelsea, he would pat any passing ragamuffin on the head, in case it's one of mine. She talks about uh, she was steeped in Jewishness. Every time somebody came on television, Mummy would say he's Jewish. Uh, we were thrilled when Frankie Vaughan got to number one in the hit parade. He was called Vaughan because his grandmother said to him, in a thick Yiddish accent. Frankie, you are my number one grandson. When she went to Cambridge, she was finally allowed to own a bicycle, but she was too short to uh, reach the ground by lowering her feet from the pedals, so she had to fully dismount every time she reached some traffic lights. Some amusing little lines here. Not very vegan, but um, she says... Uh, I've always felt that smoked salmon was an essential ingredient of any social occasion, but it must, like a woman, be moist. And she talks about the uh, US invasion of the Bay of Pigs and the very real threat of a nuclear war. Um, her friend Liz said, We were certain that the world was going to end in a nuclear holocaust, and when it didn't, nothing has seemed quite so bad ever since. Oh, and she was on um, University Challenge. She was, um, she was the first woman to say fuck on TV, although they did obviously edit it out before it, 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 it went on air. And she had an incident where basically she had to hit, she had to like hitch a ride on a boat, a boat. Um, and the guy, well she says, then I saw that you're taking his penis out of his dungarees and he was enthusiastically masturbating. I thought, blimey, what am I gonna do? I don't wanna get raped, not on the sea. So I got up, went over to him and tossed him off. And her friend, when she told that story, thought that she meant she, she threw him overboard, which she did not. This was interesting because here she talks, um, well she says, radio drama taught me that you should always talk to an audience as if it's one person. Um, and funnily enough, David Attenborough said the exact same thing in his Life on Air, which um, I've recently been reading via audiobook. And she talks about how she had elocution lessons. Miss Plowman, her elocution teacher, said, Remember, vowels carry the emotion in a word. Consonants carry the sense. Uh, she also taught Dame Maggie Smith. So she's talking a little bit more about sexuality and her friends in the gay community. She says, I wouldn't want to be straight for the world. In the dreadful AIDS time in the 80s, I lost 34 friends. Beautiful, talented, funny, warm gay boys. I mourn them. It was a terrible loss. What the boys do in bed, I've never understood. I can hardly bear the thought of anal sex. I've never been fucked up the bum and I'm happy to die wondering, as mummy might say. But I won't castigate anyone for their sexual practices unless they're cruel or violent. Um, she tells about when she 
when she uh, her, her parents kind of figured out that she had a, a passion for another woman. She says, men don't take lesbianism seriously unless they want to watch. And some more on lesbianism, she says, um, but may I say strongly that being a lesbian is not enough. It's not all there is. It's simply another adjective to describe a person. And when people say, oh, you must meet X, she's a lesbian too. I groan with irritation. I don't want to live in a lesbian world. I want to live in the world with everyone else. I would never deny my sexuality. Indeed, I'm often accused of trumpeting it far too stridently and often. But please don't shut me or anyone else in a lesbian cage. Some gay women only want to be with gay women. I don't. I pick the people in my life because of who they are, not because of who they sleep with. Let's open the closet and take our place in the world. Which I think is a beautiful sentiment. She says, life's like cheesecake, you want to have as much as you can. And um, she came out to her parents and then pretty much straight after her mum had a stroke. Um, and she always felt as though she'd caused her mum's stroke and um, she kind of wished that she hadn't come out to them. She says, I realise now that telling people things that they can't deal with is an indulgence. I believe that if people want to reveal their sexuality, they, sh they should, but the matter should not be forced. Some people cannot accept their loved ones being homosexual, and if they can't accept it, they shouldn't have to. It's indulgent of those of us who are gay to say, you've got to know this, you've got to share this. I don't think that's right. Of course, it's better if people can be open with the people they love and talk about it with their family. It's always better if everybody can truly be who they're meant to be. But my insistence on opening up hurt the people I love most in the world. My friend Ian McKellen and I have a constant difference of opinion on this matter. He feels that you should come out as an encouragement to others and be true to yourself. And I say, it depends who you're coming out to. It hurt my parents too much and it didn't please me particularly, so I think it was an error. And I think that's the thing, is it's a decision, decision everyone has to make, you know. I think some of the worst things are when like tabloid press like outs a celebrity and they're forced to come out and make a statement saying that they are gay or lesbian or bisexual or whatever it is before they're ready. Um, another example of this, I can't remember who it was, but I remember reading about um, a celebrity who, uh, I think it was Ellen DeGeneres, um, basically got them to confirm on her show that she was pregnant and then a couple of days later she had a miscarriage and th so then she had to, you know, go public and announce that she'd had a miscarriage when she hadn't even wanted to announce that she was pregnant, you know. People have to do this in their own time, you can't force them. So after her mum dies, um, she says, The personal experience of tragedy opened my eyes and gave me a compassion I'd lacked until then. I realised then that life could get up and bite you, and now COVID has got it up and bitten us all. I know that kindness and gentleness are the most valuable commodities. Now more than ever, they demand distribution. So I thought this was quite interesting. She's talking about stage fright here. She says, My stage fright has only increased as I've got older. The expectations of the audience have become so much tighter, and I don't want to let them down. And now I have a bucket in the wings because I'm so often sick before I go on stage. I'm not alone in this regard. Maggie Smith told me in Australia when she was performing the Alan Bennett monologues in Sydney how terribly nervous she gets to the point of vomiting. Well, it's no business like show business. Uh, so we learned that she blacked up for one of her roles. She talks about it unflinchingly, although she, she does say obviously she regrets, regrets to admit it. She says, almost as bad as blacking up in a film called Stand Up Virgin Soldiers, I played Ethel the Chinese whore. And for that part, I had my eyelids pulled towards my temples with a kind of sticky transparent tape so that it supposedly made me look Chinese. More on this later. It's very embarrassing to have to admit that, but I did. She says by the middle of the 80s, she was the top earning female voiceover artist in the country. She says, I was also renowned for being ruthless with the script. If I thought that the grammar was bad, I would say so. I'm sorry, I'm not saying this. It's incorrect. Can we alter it, please? Those advertising chaps always said yes. We learned that she was enjoying doing voice work, but she wanted to do some... Um, you know, some proper acting as well. So she writes about it here, she says, Brian Drew was my agent for everything, both for voices and for what I would term proper acting work on stage or film. I was getting the voice jobs all right, thanks to Wendy Knoll, but then Wendy retired and all I seemed to be getting was voice work. I really wanted to act to be a proper actress playing all sorts of parts and I thought, well, maybe if I suck Brian off, I'll get better work. I went to his office one day and did exactly that. I thought of it then as a career incentive. I remember saying, how do you think it's all shaping up, Brian? Because I don't seem to be doing much except voiceovers. It must have been me that offered because I don't think I would have been on top of Brian's list for mouse sex. He was a nice man even if he was a bit lazy. Maybe the conversation stalled and it seemed a good moment. I said, would you like me to suck you off? And he must have said yes because I did. But it didn't bring me any more work. Put that one down to experience. Soon after I left Brian Drew. It left a nasty taste I suppose. And she writes, when people say to me, oh I never talk about money, religion or politics, I say what the fuck do you talk about then? Those are the things that matter. Money is one of life's essentials and there's no point pretending that it isn't. It matters how you earn money, what you do with it and how you spend it. Yeah, I suppose that's true. And also, I mean, I'm a big fan of like, voting with our dollars so to speak, you know. Uh, you know, I'm a vegan, I mention that from time to time. And part of, um, you know, why I'm a vegan is that if by spending my money on, you know, meat alternatives and plant-based options, it increases the market for it. 
So she talks here about reviews and I think that writers could learn a lot from it as well. Um, and then there's a little, a little funny bit at the end, so I'll read you the whole lot. I looked up the reviews just now as I write this, which is the first time I've ever read them. I strongly believe reviews should not be read during the run of a show. Good reviews can make you smug, bad reviews depress, and if a company member is singled out, it can cause jealousy. I give strict instructions never to mention or discuss reviews in my hearing while the show is running, but it was a long time ago, and since mine were good, I reproduced them here. Maneuvering her stout form like a miniature battleship, Miriam Margulies is formidable and robustly funny as Cecily's gently consensorious governess, the fatefully forgetful Miss Prism. That was from the New York Times. From Theatre Mania, giving Redgrave a run for the money is Margulies, whose prism moves about with the slow splendour of an ocean liner going out to sea. Miss Prism often repeats the warning, you reap what you sow, and what Margulies reaps is great appreciation for her performance. To be compared to one ship is unfortunate, but to be compared to two looks like carelessness. Her dad used to snort and say, friends are people who drag you down, how wrong he was. I kind of agree with her father, but you know, I don't have many friends. I have lots of acquaintances, I would say. She says, I usually pick up a new friend or two on a production, which is why my phone contains a list of 11,833 names. I hope she's joking about that. Mine probably has 33 <laughs> and it needs tidying up because 20 of them are spam. And here she talks about delivering feedback, and this is another one that could be useful to you if you are friends with writers and they ask you to read their books. She says, I want to make people happy. I've always tried to smile and say positive complimentary things. In the theatre that is sometimes difficult. There is an art in going backstage after seeing a performance. Certain formula responses can mask disappointment at a production without destroying the person. Famous ones are, what about you? Delivered with a big smile and a hug, along with, you really stood out tonight. With close friends I say, I thought you were marvellous. Should we talk about it tomorrow? Because because occasionally you can say something useful but not straight after a show. I always mention if I can't hear what people are saying or if their hair hides their face because that's something that can be immediately rectified. We all should try to make people feel good. If you can't say something nice then shut up and don't say anything at all. Of course sometimes I can't help saying horrible things about people I don't like but it's not on the whole to their faces. Nice. She talks about when um well, here we go. I took the train up to Birmingham for the audition and arrived at Pebble Mill Studios. A woman in reception with a clipboard greeted me. She said, right then, so you're the three o'clock, are you? That's Miriam, uh, oh, that's new. Like many others, she had difficulty with my last name. Yeah, I, I struggle with it as well. She talks about the time she was waiting to meet Dolly Parton with Graham Norton and she did a massive fart. Um, and there's some amusing sort of little description of it, but also it taught me something. Uh, she, it says, Queen Elizabeth I said to the Earl of Oxford when he returned to court after his seven year banishment following an inadvertent breaking of wind. My lord, we had forgot the fart. And she talks about Rowan Atkinson here who she worked with on Blackadder. And funnily enough, I wrote an article recently for a client on people who struggled with public speaking and Rowan Atkinson was one of them. Um, and she says here, although I didn't know many of the other regular cast members personally, I instantly liked Rowan Atkinson. The thing that fascinated me most was his nervousness. I don't know if he still is, but he was extremely anxious and shy and he used to get angry with himself for getting things wrong. His stammer is not evident now, but he definitely had a faltering delivery then and it used to infuriate him. He was such a good actor, he was his own fiercest critic. He was never nasty to anybody else, but he just couldn't bear it when he made mistakes and would work himself into a frenzy. It was painful to see his face would contort with rage at himself. She talks about her love for Dickens. She said, Dickens created over 2,000 characters and there are 14,000 letters and novellas, journalism and speeches, words poured out of him, more than any other writer I can think of. She's got some advice here for, um, you know, young actors getting into the business and also some stories about um, ones Ones that are well known, you know, and should have got more respect than they did. She says, I was still channeling Shelley Winters. When a casting director asked her what she'd done before, she leaned down into her bag and took out one Oscar, then the other Oscar and thumped them down on the desk. That's what I've done, she said. I also love the story about the brilliant actress Athene Saylor. When a director asked her what she'd done, she said, do you mean this morning? On another occasion when she was asked what parts she liked playing, she looked at them with a curled lip and said, scornful parts. I'd advise young actors, remember that when you go into an audition, you have the right to be there. Your talent gives you the right to be there and don't let anyone put you down. Make them see you as a person, engage. Make the first move, take control. She talks about living in, in LA. She says, the thing about living in LA is that everybody is afraid of failure and fatness. And I was afraid of neither. They're so enthralled to success and celebrity that they're terrified it might not happen. You shouldn't fear failure. It's not something that we relish. No one wants to fail, but it may be something we have to endure in order to improve and succeed. She talks about um, an episode of Dharma and Greg that she appeared in. She said uh, this quote, she said, I have to say it wasn't very good, but this quote from it makes me laugh. 
Uh, Dharma reading a book about pregnancy. Set aside time each day to dialogue with your vagina. Greg, is that the new Harry Potter book? Foreshadowing what's to come later on. So she talks about Warren Beatty. Um, I don't personally know a huge amount about Warren Beatty, but she characterizes him pretty well here, I think. I, I think I know all I need to know about Warren Beatty from reading this. My first brush with Hollywood, though, wasn't until 1980 when I was called to audition for Warren Beatty for a small part as the secretary of the Communist Party. I didn't even have a line, but it wasn't a bad role. The film was Reds, and it was about the life and career of John Reed, the American journalist and communist activist. Mr. Beatty, who, according to his biographer, has had sex with 12,775 women, a number he disputes, insisted that he could only meet me in his trailer at lunchtime. I knocked at the door. He said, come in. He then looked at me up, down, up, quite slowly and said, do you fuck? Yes, but not you, I replied. Why is that, he asked. Because I'm a lesbian, I said. He grinned and said, can I watch? I replied, pull yourself together and get on with the interview. She talks about working with Arnold Schwarzenegger, who she is clearly not too much of a fan of. Um, she says, less fun was working with Arnold Schwarzenegger in the 1999 supernatural thriller, End of Days. What a pig of a man. Although he was relatively professional with me, because he didn't fancy me, he was awfully gropey with women he was interested in. He thought a lot of himself, but I wasn't surprised. He was a bodybuilder from Austria who had gone on to become a huge star. In my whole acting career, this is the only fight I can remember. I was playing Mabel, Satan's sister, and I had to tussle with Arnold, a prospect I did not relish. But on the day he was professional, he taught me how to punch and scratch. My main and most lingering memory of being in that film, however, is of Schwarzenegger's bottom. My character was killed by having my throat sliced by a glass table at the end. The scene ended, and Schwarzenegger farted right in my face when I was down on the floor, trying not to move. It was such a noxious cloud, I shouted, Fuck you, Arnie! I think he did it because I'd farted on set and he felt a tit for tat was due. She's talking about uh, things she did with Barbara Streisand. Um, I don't have that much respect for Barbara Streisand, but purely because of the Streisand effect, which is that when you try and suppress information, it just in ensures it spreads more widely. She tried to get Google to remove her house from their Google aerial maps. However, I do like this concept that comes up. When I told this story to Heather, she said that in Indonesia, people consciously present themselves in public. So they actually have a phrase in Dutch to convey that moment when people have to gather themselves up in readiness to perform. Drempelvries, fear of thresholds. That's what Barbara was doing. We all do it to a certain extent, of course. Perhaps we don't think that we officially present ourselves in public. We think that we are carrying our persona inside and outside, but we don't. I know that I don't. I'm a different person in public. I'm more upbeat, more fun, more outgoing than I really am in private. She talks about when she was working with Martin Scorsese uh, and how she broke the ice, as it were. Even before filming began, I found an unorthodox way to break the ice among cast and crew. I was the last person the crew saw during the makeup and costume test, and I came at the end of a very... I could see at once how tired everyone was. I did what I often do to show my appreciation. I made a small speech. I said I was grateful that they'd all been so kind to stay so late, and that the best thing I could do to show my appreciation was to show you my breasts. I lifted up my top, pulled up my bra, and let them have it. Their faces were a picture. No one could be serious after that. It cheered them up no end. I think most crews are breast people. I think most people are breast people. She talks about her first trip down under in a chapter by the same name. My first greeting on landing in Australia was when the immigration clerk said to me painfully slowly, can you read? I looked at her and thought, what the fuck is this all about? I said, yes, quite slowly. She had in her hand some documents and pointing to one of them, she said again, can you read? Yes, I replied again slowly. Can you read this? I looked at the document and said, yes. Then I got a bit irritated and said, look here, is there a problem? I've actually got a degree in English from Cambridge University. The woman took a step back and said, ah, sorry miss, you haven't signed your form. I thought you was an ethnic. That was my welcome to Australia. And of course she was right, I am. She talks about how she likes Philip Schofield and Holly Willoughby from uh, this morning, which has aged like a fine wine, hasn't it? She talks about her snack of choice, which I'm down with this. I mean, I've eaten a raw onion for um, a YouTube video back in the day. She says, I turned up to the first day of filming with a bag of my snack of choice, whole raw Spanish onions. When I first peeled then chomped into one, everyone grimaced, imagining, I suppose, how ghastly it must taste. But I just munched away. I couldn't understand what all the fuss was about. I've eaten raw onions all my life. I like the taste. I like radishes too, the sharper the better in my book. They make my eyes water, but I don't mind. Same with curries. I don't know if it's good for the constitution or not, but it's sensible in winter because my onion habit tends to keep people away from me, so I catch fewer colds. True, I'm slightly less popular in the makeup trailer. So she talks about um, her Jewishness. 
um, you know, learning about the Nazi camps uh, as a child. And then she talks about, uh, well, she says, yeah, because of Israel, because of Netanyahu and the way he's behaved, the band-aid over anti-Semitism has been ripped off. Watching events in Israel, people feel that it's all right now to voice anti-Semitism. Violence against Jewish graves and shops and synagogues is on the rise. And so I've become more strident in talking about being Jewish, forcing people to absorb it, challenging them to deny their prejudice. Um, and it's kind of forward thinking or prophetic in a way because of what's happening right now in uh, Israel uh, between uh, the Jews and the Palestinians, the Israelis and the Palestinians. Um, and actually I read a report recently that said both um, anti-Semitism and um, Islamophobia are both on the rise. Why is it anti-Semitism and Islamophobia? Why isn't it anti-Semitism and anti-Islamism? or Semophobia and Islamophobia. Anyway, and she's very much against um, what Israel is, uh, what the Israelis are doing um, to the Palestinians. She says here, so much energy has been focused on the concept of Israel, the return to Zion, the homeland. And when people are trying to destroy you, and not just trying, but succeeding in destroying you, you cling on to the chance of life and hope and a continuation of the family and the people and the nation. But when the Zionists reclaimed Israel, they didn't take into account the Palestinians who were already living there. What were they supposed to do? Were they supposed to disappear? That's where, as a people, we Jews fell down and where Hitler won. He changed us from being a compassionate nation into a destructive, uncaring and inhumane one. The tragedy of the Palestinians is just as much the tragedy of the Jews. Which, yes and no, because... I mean, one is the perpetrator of a crime, one is the victim, you know. Although then you do have the other way around. You do have then, you know, um, Islamic militants and stuff trying to free Palestine so it's I don't publicly talk about my views on um, on on the conflict in the Middle East because well what am I I'm not Jewish I'm not um, Muslim I, I don't I don't see what the fuss is about it's I understand it's supposed to be a holy land and there's a lot of fighting about who gets to occupy the holy land personally I think the best thing to do None of them have it. It's like, well, you know, when you're with kids and the kids are fighting because they're all trying to play with the same toy. You take the toy away, you're like, that's it. Because you can't agree and you can't share, none of you can have it. I think that's what we should do with Israel. And she talked about modern politics in a way that I very much enjoy because I agree with a lot of what she says. Uh, Brexit is the biggest catastrophe of my adult life. The fact that my European citizenship has been taken away from me by this crowd of charlatans and rascals is appalling. I cannot understand it. It's a madness that has overwhelmed the nation. Prejudice and racism abound. There could easily be a pogrom in this country now. It could be against Jews or more likely against Muslims. It could even be against the traveller community. There are too many people boiling with hate and resentment and it is alarming. I'm getting angrier and more disappointed with the world as I get older. I'm shocked at the effect that Johnson and his cronies have had on our lives. I love Britain culture but the beauties of our country are being corrupted and destroyed. I'm particularly horrified by this government's vindictive attacks on the BBC under the guise of protecting free speech. Boris Johnson is like Trump, a ruthless, dangerous narcissist drunk with power. She talks again a bit more about the the current situation. Um, she says, more recently I did a conversation piece with Vanessa Redgrave in The Guardian. We talked about theatre mostly, but of course politics came into it. After the piece was published, I looked at the comments online. Most were complimentary, but one said two anti-Semites talking to each other. No thank you. I'm not an anti-Semite and neither is Vanessa. That, however, is what happens when you criticise Israel. You're instantly persona non grata. You're not allowed to be critical of Israel, although Israel deserves criticism of the most severe kind. The law of return states that any Jew born anywhere in the world can go and live in Israel. No Palestinian can. That is wrong. Let us see the humanity in the other. Let's not start with terror and murder. When you go to Israel, visit Palestine too. See for yourselves how Israelis behave to the Palestinians. It is not acceptable. I believe that people have to face up to the moral implications of their actions and not sit on a fence. And I've made my choice. I don't sit on the fence. I don't want to be somebody who says on one hand and then on the other hand. My country, right or wrong, doesn't work for me. I'm on the side of humanity. If I see a wrong, I feel I must do my best to right it. That is who I am. We have a little more here. I'd forgotten how much she actually dedicates to this. Um, the appalling acts of Palestinian and Arab terrorism are not ignored by me. I loathe them and will never defend such things. Their cruelty, insanity and continual murder are facts. But ask yourselves why? I don't acknowledge the claims of history. I care about now, the present. That land must be shared. People must be treated equally. It is possible if the will is there. If the diaspora Jews brought pressure to bear on the Israeli government, attitudes could change. Jews in Europe and America are beginning to realise what is going on. Slowly, too slowly, the tide is turning. Israel must change or it will destroy itself. 
It would be much easier not to speak out. My support for Palestine has brought me great heartache, but I can only speak my truth. Whenever I raise money for Jewish causes, which I do frequently, people say to me, now Miriam, don't be controversial. How can I not be controversial? It's like my parents not wanting me to be a lesbian. They're asking me to be another Miriam. I can't accept that something wrong is being done in my name. I am a proud Jew. I fight anti-Semitism wherever I see it. I'm not a believer, but I adore the culture I spring from and honor it. I believe people can change. Truth is not hard to see if you open your eyes. And I do think the current sort of what's happening at the moment is causing people to open their eyes, you know? She talks about um, her relationship with the royal family. She's a big fan of them. Um, she has met Prince Charles a, a bunch of times. She says here, I have to say, I think Australia should choose to be a republic, but I would be very happy to have King Charles. It all started when His Royal Highness wrote me a lovely letter out of the blue about my 1998 unabridged audiobook of Oliver Twist. It was four pages in his own handwriting. Of course, I wrote back. I always write in pen on good writing paper. I never take a copy. And obviously now he is King Charles, so she was probably... I bet she had mixed feelings because she was a fan of the Queen. So, you know. She talks about people not offering their seat on public transport. She says, I've noticed that the people who do offer their seat are usually women. Men rarely bother. They pretend to be too engrossed in a newspaper to notice if someone needs to sit down. I don't know if that's true. I mean, I guess I wouldn't know because on public transport, I'm always reading a book. So I may not notice people. But I've noticed the other thing, the other way around, like when I used to have to take the bus to work, I was on crutches. I'd um, sprain my ankle. I still have some issues with it actually now that I've got back into running. But I'd, I'd sprain my ankle and was on crutches and I had to get the bus to work and nobody would let me have a seat because I was a young man. But I was on crutches and then so uh, inevitably at one point the, br the bus broke too quickly and then I went arse over to it and hit the floor and nobody helped me up either. So yeah, that was nice. But normally if I see somebody who needs a seat, I'll give it to them because I don't mind standing anyway, as long as I'm not on fucking crutches. She talks about being cast in uh, The Lady in the Van. Um, she says, I was so nervous about taking on the role that I went round to Alan Bennett's house to get his blessing. Um, I love The Lady in the Van. Uh, the book of it's great as well. I've not seen the play. I've seen the movie of it um, and read the book. She talks about how um, afraid she is of death. Um, which so am I. She says, a good death to me means that you die in bed, hopefully without pain, surrounded by people you love, and you can smile at them, close your eyes and go. That's what I long for. But as the last 18 months have shown, you can't count on anything. So many people have died in isolation wards without being able to see their loved ones. The pandemic has even removed the therapeutic side of funerals. Funerals don't work on Zoom. The whole point is the living, breathing people. I want to see all my friends and fellow mourners and be able to talk and sing and cry together, sharing our memories of the person we're there to honour, and experience the black humour, finding joy in those shared memories of the dead. That's what I love most about funerals. I think laughter is better than God. Um, and obviously that's interesting cause to kind of almost end the book with. There's a little bit more here, um, including a chapter on dirty talk. Um, but obviously, I mean, she is 80 plus, so she doesn't have too much to go, unfortunately. She talks about how she joined the Apostrophe Protection Society, as that little mark is also rapidly becoming another lost cause. It's a war I'm still fighting, but on my own now, as sadly the society is closed down. Um, I've heard of the Apostrophe Pro Pro Protection Society and considered joining it myself. And interestingly here, she kind of notes that when you're writing a book, it's different to being in a play or uh, because you can't see what the audience makes of your performance. She says, one of the best moments of a performance is waiting in the wings after the curtain has descended. When you know you've given your all, remembered every line and cue and the audience has responded as you hoped, laughing at the right moments and being moved at others. There is always a hush and a caught breath as you wait for their reaction. It's not like that with books. I don't have a clue how the various acts and scenes of my life have gone down with you, my dear reader. I hope you've enjoyed reading it. I've enjoyed living it. But now I realize my days like these pages are numbered. William Saroyan wrote, everybody has got to die, but I've always believed an exception would be made in my case. Given its inescapable nature, therefore, I want to do it well. In interviews now, I'm always asked, are you scared of death? Of course I fucking am. Absolutely shit scared most of the time. But death itself is just the end of things. It's the dying that's the problem. The last two years have been particularly difficult to bear. As a fat, old person, the threat of the pandemic is immediate and real. During lockdown, I wouldn't even leave the house to go to a shop. I was too nervous. That may be why I'm so rude and noisy a lot of the time. I'm trying to keep the Grim Reaper away. And so far, it's working. Well, Miriam, uh, as you can probably tell if you've watched to this point in the review, I did enjoy reading this book. I think there's, uh, it's one of those um, sort of autobiographies you could enjoy even if you didn't know who Miriam Margulies was. But um, if you do, you're going to get a little bit extra out of it, obviously. Lots of food for thought. Again, ton of discussion stuff. I noticed as I'm filming this, this is probably the most raw footage I've had for a review in a long time. Certainly more than I normally have for a fiction book because there's just so much I wanted to talk about and share. Um, 
again i guess it's partly because she's lived for 80 plus years so she's had a long life and um lots of experiences to talk about but yes i gave this much as true by miriam margulies a four out of five yeah so there we have it, that's what I made of This Much Is True by Miriam Margulies. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.